Hello, Tanya Laird here, and welcome to part 6 of lecture 11 of ENGR 2301 Engineering Statics. In this portion of the lecture, we are going to finally look at some examples of analyzing frames in simple machines. So, first example here, I'm just going to work through something that is basically just an extended version of a beam. Although it will be a frame because it's made of several, it's made of two distinct members. So example one here. And in most of these, for again, for this portion, for this lecture, we're not uh, concerned with member end forces. We're, or sorry, member internal forces. We're only looking at member external forces or end forces. So that's what I'm going to be asking us to find as we go through this. So example one is going to be relatively simple. Uh, we're going to have a beam. We'll have a beam that it has a pin in the middle, but also has a roller on the end. So let's say you have something like this. We have a beam, and um, well, uh, yeah. Actually, let's do something like this. Well, let me think. Oh, uh, that work. No, I do. I do need to have a fixed end if I'm going to do what I want to do. So let's say I have something like this. A beam that is fixed on one end. And then at its middle, there is a pin. And then there's a pin here and another member here. And all this is uh, just uh, purely horizontal. And then at this end where the beam ends, we have a roller. We have some sort of roller. And uh, let's give dimensions of this. So it's a fixed end and then a roller end. So this is supported on a surface. And despite my poor drawing, this is not a tapered beam or anything. This is uh, nice and horizontal. So I'm not even going to bother giving any kind of vertical dimensions to this. We're assuming the, big, the beam thickness is nominal compared to its length, or is not significant. So uh, let's say we have this, and let's give dimensions of, oh, I don't know, maybe 8 feet and 4 feet. And then, uh, actually I'll probably define maybe another... Uh, four feet here, because I want to apply some loads to this. And let's say we have a point load here of, I don't know, oh, maybe, mm, let's say 12 uh, kips, 12 kips, and let's put this thing at an angle of 30 degrees. 12 kips at an angle of 30 degrees. Or, sorry, 60 degrees. I wanted to make that a little steeper. An angle of 60 degrees, so mostly in the Y, but some in the X as well. So relatively simple. And I'm going to ask us to find all of the, uh, find the, uh, let's go ahead and give the joints as well. Eight joint names, A, B, C, and D. And all of this is given, and I want to find, uh, let's just say, the reaction forces on joints A and D and the uh, forces being transmitted through the pin at C. Uh, on pin C. So let's take a look. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. And just as I mentioned previously, when we looked at this uh, in, my, in uh, the fourth portion of this lecture, the, I mentioned that the first step is often to try to get as many of our uh, unknown uh, reaction forces as we can by treating the entire frame as a single rigid body. So I'm just going to say, okay, I know this pin actually is able to rotate, but ignoring that, let's just treat this, pin, this whole thing as a single rigid body, ignoring any kind of internal joints, pins, etc. So if that pin weren't there, what kind of forces would be on this? I would have my joint A. I'm just going to go ahead and ignore any kind of internal joints like C, the pin there. Um, and then I would have B. I do need to include that joint because there's a force applied there, an external force. And then D. Then I would have dimensions. Oh, let's see. That, that would be, oh, actually, and this is 4 feet and 4 feet. And let's say this is then the relevant dimensions would be uh, 4 feet and 8 feet. Now what kind of reactions would we apply to this beam? Well, I would have, let's see, I would have an... What would I have? I would have an AX. 
I would have to have an AX. I would have an AY. An AY. I'll have some sort of MA present. And I'm going to have a DY, some force at D. Some force at D. So that's good. Um, let's see, what else can we do? And then we, of course, have our reaction or our, uh, not our reaction, our applied force, the 12 kip force here at, six, uh, at an angle of 60 degrees. So we're not actually going to be able to get a whole lot of this. We're going to be severely limited until we can start breaking this thing up into its component pieces. But uh, oh, oh well, that's OK. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, let's look at this and say, OK, well, uh, I'll do a summation of forces on this. This is on the global free body diagram. This is a global equilibrium analysis. Uh, sum of forces in the x direction. I'm going to have ax and then plus 12 kips uh, times the cosine of 60 degrees. So 12 kips times the cosine of 60 degrees. And uh, this will mean, of course, and this equals zero because it's a statics class, and that means that AX is equal uh, to negative six kips, or just six kips to the left. So we'll have a, a reaction force AX of six kips to the left. Now, um, we could do a balance of forces in the vertical direction, but I don't know. Oh, that should actually be called, should be labeled DY there. Sorry about that. It should be called DY. And uh, let's see. If we do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, the problem we're going to have is that this force and this force will both be present there. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. Also, if we do a balance of forces in the, if we do a balance of moments, the problem with this moment is that there's no point that we won't have at least one unknown force present there. So this is going to be a bit of a problem. Um, let's see, how could we do this? We may not, we may not have any way around this except just doing systems of equations. That may be the only thing we actually can ultimately do. That's unfortunate. Um, but, uh, oh well, when in Rome. Uh, so, I think we're going to actually be stuck doing systems of equations on this one, which is not what I really wanted to introduce us to this stuff with, but uh, I suppose uh, you do what you got to do. Uh, so let's see, are there any other options other than doing balance of moments? The problem is all of these uh, forces, if there, if this was pointed in this direction, for example, I could find the moment about the point where this force and this force's line of action meet, and then just directly solve for MA at least, but there's just no way to get these directly. Okay, so we're going to have to do, it is statically determined, and I know that, because if you think about it, we have how many unknowns? We have one, two, three, four, and then the two, uh, five, six in the middle here, and we have two um, pieces. That means uh, six equations of equilibrium, so this is solvable. Um, we have six unknowns, ultimately, and six equations of equilibrium. This is completely determinate. This is 100% statically determinate. So I guess I could do a summation of moments. Um, maybe about uh, joint A. Let's try that. Summation of moments about joint A. So what will that get me? If I do a summation of moments about joint A, uh, the A forces will not generate any moment there, and the, the horizontal component of this won't either. So I will have, um, let's see, but the moment of the dy will, and the moment at A will. So I'll have MA. Again, recalling that MA has no um, that MA has no uh, moment arm. And then um, plus dy times the moment arm length of 12 feet. And then uh, minus uh, 12 kips times, uh, it's the, that is going to be the sine of 60 degrees, the sine of 60 degrees, and this is then equal to zero. So MA plus 12 dy minus 12 uh, sine 60. Oh, and I can't forget the moment arm length for that. Moment arm length at point A is four feet. And that is all equals zero because this is, in static e this is in static equilibrium. So basically what I end up with is MA plus 12 dy is equal to, uh, so 12 sine 60 uh, times four. I'm just gonna collapse that to one number. And let's go ahead and do this as an ugly decimal so we can solve for this later. Uh, so 12 sine, sine 60 uh, times uh, 4, and I just move this over there, I get 41.5692. Uh, 
and this is in units with kip feet. So as long as I do my moment and my forces and kips and my uh, distances in kip feet, I can just ignore the units right now on this for now on that. Okay, so that's one equation we'll be able to use later on. Then um, let's go ahead and do a summation of moments. Oh, maybe about joint D uh, there. So let's do a summation of moments about joint D. So a summation of moments about joint D. Now let's consider this here. If I do a summation of moments about joint D, what will I get? Um, I will have, first I'll have my MA. I'll have MA. Then I'll have a negative moment caused by AY. So negative AY, uh, whatever that vertical reaction force, and the AX and the horizontal component of the 12 kip force aren't going to generate any moment about D because their line of action passes right through point D. So minus AY times the moment arm length of 12 feet, uh, and then uh, plus a positive moment from the, this will generate a positive uh, moment or a counterclockwise moment about joint D, the, the uh, applied force will. So plus 12 kips, uh, again times the sine of 60, uh, and then times a moment arm length of 8 feet. And all of this is equal to zero. And so then I end up with an equation that says MA, uh, MA plus, uh, or actually minus 12 AY, minus 12 AY is equal to negative uh, 12 sine 60 times eight. So that comes to negative 83.1384. So that's equal to negative 83.1384. In other words, I believe that is simply twice that. If I divide that by two, it should be, yep, that is just uh, twice that. Okay, so I have two equations here that I can't really go any further. I could try doing more balance of equilibrium on this particular single rigid body, but I know that I'm never going to really be able to get more than three useful equations. So I think instead I need to move on to uh, breaking this up and looking at it at, in the uh, exploded view. So I'm going to do some transcribing here. Well, I guess I'm just going to first uh, jump to the uh, exploded view. So I'm going to separate this into its two components. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and draw these as line elements instead of the uh, box elements that I had previously. Now, I'm going to have the same forces. The free body diagram is going to be very similar, except I'm just going to go ahead and um, sometimes you can do it either way. I'm just going to go ahead and apply the AX in its correct direction now because I do know which direction it is. Originally, I assumed it was to the right, but I know it's actually to the left. So I'm going to put just a, a six kips like here. But I don't know any of the other forces yet, so I'm going to put AY and MA in the same direction I originally assumed. So AY here and MA, like so. And then I'm going to show my uh, 12 kip force at uh, on joint B. And in fact, maybe I'll make this one a little bit longer and then put a little more space in here. I want to give myself plenty of room here. And then another element over here for the second portion of the beam uh, where we have on the right side of the pin joint. So I'm going to have the 12 kip force at 60 degrees, the 12 kip force at an angle of 60 degrees, and since I've now cut this, I am revealing two internal forces. This is a pin joint, so that means at the pin joint, a horizontal and a vertical force can be transmitted, and in this case will be transmitted. Well. Maybe not, we'll see if it will be, but can be transmitted through the pin. As far as which direction I assume, that it does not matter in the slightest. I can just go ahead and assume, uh, for uh, for sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna go ahead and assume on this side, it's to the right and upward. I could just assume, I just as well assume that this is to the left and upward, or this is to the left and downward, or any combination of the two. But what I absolutely have to do, and I don't have any choice in the matter, is that if I assume this CX is going to the right, it's all, again, all of statics ultimately can be expressed as force pairs. As we've seen again and again and again in this semester, in this course, uh, statics always comes down to force pairs. Forces always and always and always, forever and ever, amen, always come in equal and opposite force pairs. And so if I'm drawing CX on this one to the right, its matching brother has to be uh, to the left. And if this CY is upward, this one has to be downward. Then we still have our dy here, 
And because these still are the same actual external forces, the equations that were valid here are also valid here now. And then I should list the dimensions. We're going to have dimensions of 4 feet uh, and 4 feet. Now I am going to go ahead and write some, um, copy the equations, because I think we're going to need those. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, copy these down from over here. So MA, so this is just the side, so I don't have to, so I don't have to keep jumping back and forth. MA plus 12DY is equal to 41.5692. That's our first equation that we got from taking the moments about joint A. And then the, the second equation the, that we got from taking the moments about joint D is MA minus 12AY. Uh, minus 12AY is equal to negative 83.1384. 1384 here. All right, so let's go ahead and work through this now. I'm thinking, let's see, what would be the easiest way to do this? We have different ways we might approach this. Uh, several different ways we might approach this. Uh, let's see. I'm thinking I might look at joint. I, th I think it makes more sense to look at member. Uh, as I'm looking through this, you could do either one, um, but I think it's going to make more sense to start with uh, piece one here. Or if these are joints A, uh, B, C, and D, C and D here. And of course, this is four feet in the middle here, this, that dimension. Uh, I think we're going to start with member ABC. And then later we can look at member uh, CBD or CD. So we have member ABC. And then next, next we're going to look at uh, member uh, CD. Now, the first thing we can do is knock out CX. That's going to be very quick. Uh, summation of forces in the X direction. I will have the negative six kips that we solved for previously, that is the AX, uh, plus um, that's going to be 12 kips times the cosine of 60 degrees, and then plus CX equals zero because this is in static equilibrium. However, these two cancel each other out. Uh, 12 cosine, uh, 12 kips times the cosine of 60 is just positive six. And so we'll get a uh, negative six plus positive six is zero. And so then that means that CX is equal to zero. And honestly, that shouldn't surprise us. There is no, if you look at it this here, I could just look at equilibrium in the X direction on this piece as well. And CX has to be zero. It's pretty evident that CX really does have to be zero. And the reason for it is just, we'll just kind of look at it. If CX is not equal to zero, then we have some problems. CX has to be equal to zero. Well, as far as why that is, well, CX has to be zero. And the reason for it is that, um, well, if there, if CX was not equal to zero, if CX was not equal to zero, then why would that be bad? Well, there would be no other restraining force to resist that. So in fact, CX would um, cause that thing to be in motion, which would be kind of bad. So um, next, I think we're going to do a balance of moments about joint C. And the reason I'm choosing to do that is that I already have, I know that the uh, terms of that will have AY, uh, the unknowns that will appear there are AY and MA. That's going to give me another equation of equilibrium um, that I can then use to combine with this one to solve for both MA and AY. So I'm going to have uh, some moments about joint uh, C this time. I will have, let's see, AY, negative AY, times a moment arm length of 8 feet. Then I'll have plus MA, plus MA, and then um, plus uh, 12 kips sine 60 times 4 feet. 12 kips times the sine of 60 degrees. Uh, times the sine of 60 degrees times the remote arm length of 4 feet. This problem is actually going to be a little bit interesting uh, as I'm seeing going forward. So uh, we'll have uh, maybe famous last words, negative 8AY plus MA. And then this is equal to uh, 12 sine 60 uh, times 4. Uh, 12 times six, uh, 12 uh, sine 60 times 4. So uh, 12 sine of 60 times 4. This is then equal to, if I bring it onto the other side, negative uh, 41.562. Uh, 41 
uh, 41.5692, sorry. Or MA minus 8AY uh, is equal to negative 41.562. Or I could also say that MA here is equal to, uh, that's not, sorry, uh, where did that go? That should be 8AY, sorry about that. 8AY, it is equal to 8AY uh, minus 41.562. And if I combine it with this here, if I bring this to the other side, if I bring the 12AY over there, it's also equal to 12AY, uh, that will be 12AY minus 83.1384. So I'm gonna then, um, let's see, I will uh, bring this over here and this over here. So basically I end up with, I end up with 41, because these are exactly half each other, 41.562 equals uh, 4ay, equals 4ay. And then ay, if I divide 41.962 by four, or 5692, I keep saying uh, 462, but about that before, I get that AY is equal to 10.392 uh, kips. AY is equal to 10.392 kips. Okay, so we have our first uh, major reaction that we were looking for that we couldn't just get with one. Uh, next, I can do a summation. Uh, well, actually, I don't have to do any summation. I can just go ahead and directly apply this. MA is equal to uh, 8AY. minus the 41.562, or sorry, 5692. I'm doing it even when I'm writing it. Uh, 41.5692. And if I plug that in, so I'm just gonna throw that to my calculator, eight times 10.392 uh, minus the 41.5692. And oh, what do you know? I get that MA is equal to uh, 41, 0.5692, and the units for this would be kip feet. Uh, kip feet. Because we built all this in kips and feet, the, the units for the moment, even though we haven't carried it all the way through, would be in kip feet. And then, uh, once I know MA, uh, I can easily get DY as well. Just going back to this original equation, I can say that MA has to be equal to uh, 41, 41.5692 and this is where things are going to get uh, interesting. Minus uh, 12 dy, uh, like right there. Or actually, I should probably say, let me solve that one in terms of dy. If I solve this equation in terms of dy, I can say that dy is equal to 41.5692 uh, minus ma divided by 12 divided by 12. And this is where things get kind of silly. Uh, 41.5692 minus that the actual value that we got from MA, uh, 41.5692 uh, divided by 12. And we just get dy is nothing. dy is equal to zero. And that's dy. We got that. So then if I do a, if I go look at member uh, CD, if I do a simple summation of forces in the y direction, uh, I will get that I have negative cy plus dy is equal to zero. <laughs> However, we already found that dy is equal to zero, so therefore cy is also equal to zero. So this ended up being a bit of a silly problem. Uh, it turns out that there's actually no force being carried by this beam at all. At this pin, this beam, this everything beyond here is actually completely and utterly useless. Uh, th this would be a very poor way of designing a beam, unless you're counting on it to um, carry load over here. Now, if we had a load on this, that would be another case, and that'd be a little bit more interesting. But uh, yeah, on this particular one, there was no, uh, the, I probably should have applied that force over here, but that's okay. For this particular example, it'll end up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit silly. That's okay. So yeah, basically, what we effectively have here is a cantilevered beam. 
uh, there's a pointless, uh, basically there's a pointless um, load attached to it here, a pointless uh, extension here attached to it, but all of the all of the load, the vertical load is being carried by a Y, uh, all of the moment is being carried by joint A, all the horizontal force is carried by that joint. Basically, the support at joint A is doing all the work, and this portion of the beam is doing essentially absolutely nothing. So I think that's uh, a bit humorous, uh, etc. And now, let's, I think we'll look at another slightly more complex example. All right, now for example two, I want to work through a frame, another framework, and this one's going to be a bit more two-dimensional. So let's work through another framework, and I'm going to have two locations of support, uh, here and here. And let's say I'll have a pin support here and a fixed support over here. Then everything in the middle is going to be uh, basically two. I'll just have two pin joints. So a pin, uh, a member, a vertical member here, basically a little column. Up to here, then I'll have a pin joint here, and then I'll have a pin joint here, and a horizontal member between the two. If I can manage to draw a straight line, a horizontal member here. And then a diagonal member from here to here. A diagonal member from here to here. Like so. Well, that's not too bad, I've drawn worse. And let's go ahead and give this some dimensions. And I do like to, uh, we do have a mixed audience here, so I like to mix up, uh, in this particular class at least, uh, I like to mix up both English and metric. We did the last one in, in English units, so let's go ahead and do this one in metric. Um, now let's go ahead and put some uh, forces on this. And actually, just for fun, what if we make it a distributed force? So let's say this thing has oh a distributed load of hmm, maybe two kilonewtons per meter. Two kilonewtons per meter, so we can review and study how to work through those. And then let's give some dimensions to this thing. Let's say it is, oh, maybe one meter from here to here. Let's make it one meter high, so it'll be at a 45 degree angle. This is one meter high. Uh, then maybe, let's say this other one is three meters long. So uh, to here is one meter, and to here is one meter. One meter, one meter one meter, and one meter, like so. And I think that should be all we need. Now, um, let us consider, uh, well, so all this is given, and we gotta, we have to figure out what we're being asked to find. So let's just go ahead and find uh, the same thing as last time. Uh, support reaction or reaction forces, or all reaction and joint forces. A reaction and joint forces. So the external reaction and the internal joint forces, or member end forces, if you want to describe it as that. So uh, we could do this a few different ways. And uh, let's see. So let's consider this. Now, a lot of this just comes down to where do we want to begin? We could start by applying global equilibrium, and that's going to be uh, simple enough. So, uh, well, actually, first of all, I might want to prove this is statically determinant. So let me uh, let me just do a little bit, a little side note here, and looking at we look at the kind of thing we looked at in uh, the fifth portion of this lecture. I'm gonna just prove this is statically determinant first by looking at just the number of unknowns at each location. So uh, at my uh, at my uh, fixed support here, I have three unknowns. At this pin support, I have two. At this pin support, I have two. And, or sorry, pin joint, pin joint, I have two. And at this um, pin uh, support, I have two. So I have a total of six unknowns on the pins and then three more for the fixed. So that's a total of uh, nine unknowns and I have three rigid bodies, three members, so that's three equations each. I have nine unknowns and nine uh, equations of equilibrium. I am going to be able to solve for this. This is a completely statically determinate system. Although it will be, it can be a bit complex. Now, also, Interestingly enough, I know that I have a truss member here. I have a truss. 
I have something that is basically a truss uh, member. So we have that, and actually that's going to allow me to very easily um, solve this. So I'm actually going to start with something different. I could try solving this in terms of applying global equilibrium first, but I'm going to have five different unknowns. And the thing about this, if I look at just this middle member, just this middle member itself is going to be statically determinate if we think about it. See, let me show you why. Uh, let me break this up into, let me just immediately go to the global view here. So member, uh, let's see, let me give some joint names. Let's say this is A, uh, B, C, and D. So I'll have members A, B, B, C, and C, D. So first, member AB. Member AB is going to have a single axial force, is going to carry a single axial force, like this, FAB. Although, that'll be expressed in two reaction forces as well. Um, that'll be expressed in two reaction forces. And so then if I look at the equilibrium on uh, this, here. And actually, let me just go ahead and assume this is intention or something. Not really totally possible, but it's okay. Uh, FAB here. FAB. And that is at a 45 degree angle. FAB here. FAB, and this is at a 45 degree angle. Okay, so at a 45 degree angle. And then, um, but then if I looked at the joint, this joint here, actually I should probably draw it in black to be consistent. I would have this joint here, and uh, on the joint, coming into that would be FAB, but going upward this time. And then I would have an AY and an AX. And this would also be at a 45 degree angle. The only reason I'm drawing out the separate joint when I don't usually do that is because this is a, a truss member, a truss condition member, or a single axial force member. Then I can draw out uh, the middle beam which I think I'm going to start my analysis on and really get most of my uh, useful information from. This is going to be really the key to decoding all of this. Uh, I'm going to have FAB applied at the end of the pin. Pin pin. Now you might be tempted to say member BC is a pin, is a pin pin member, is a truss condition member, but actually it's not. And the reason is, is because we have a load applied in the middle. The only way we get, the only way we get that case, that nice case of only a single axial load, is if there are no intermediate loads applied between the joints, and that is the case here. So I'm going to have an FAB, the same FAB, but of course equal and opposite. Normally, again, normally I would have to have a, I'd have to show the X and Y force that is coming through this pin. But again, because this is a, because this is a uh, pin member or pin pin member, I can just say that there's a simple FAB. Then I'm going to show the distributed load. However, I'm just going to go ahead right now and replace that with a single uh, equivalent point load. And the equivalent point load is going to be two kilonewtons per meter times the length of one meter or simply two kilonewtons. And then on joint C, I will need to consider both the CX and CY because this is not a pin-pin number. I'm going to have a CX and a CY. Here, a CX and a CY. And I probably should put the dimensions on here. And this will have dimension of, well, this is going to be at the center. The whole thing is 1.5 meters long, or sorry, three meters long. So this is 1.5 meters and 1.5 meters, and this is going to be at a 45 degree angle. 45 degree angle. Then on the bottom column, or column BC, or member, or sorry, not BC, member uh, CD here. Pin joint. Add a few things, I would have a few things. 
I would have CX. I'm just assuming that everything else is going, if this is going to the right, then this one would have to be going uh, upward, or sorry, to the left. Then a, a CY here. And then down here, I would have some sort of, oh, again, I can assume whatever direction I want, DX, DY, and a MB, or MD, to be consistent with what I've been using, MD. And this would have a dimension, oh, I mean, I didn't write it on here, of one meter. And this would also have a dimension of one meter because it's the same member. So I'm going to start uh, doing equilibrium on member uh, BC here. So BC, I'm going to start by doing, I think, a summation of moments about joint B. Uh, the benefit of that is that CX and FAB both pass through that point, so I could only, only unknown will be CY. So the summation of moments about joint B, I'll do the summation of moments about joint B, and I'll have uh, negative two kilonewtons, negative moment about joint uh, B, because again, that is uh, a clockwise rotation, negative two kilonewtons, times a moment arm length of 1.5 meters, and uh, then plus positive moment from clockwise or, or counterclockwise rotation, uh, plus CY times a moment arm length of three meters. And this equals zero. And so then uh, CY is equal to uh, two kilonewtons times 1.5 over three, or this is just equal to one kilonewton. CY is just equal to one kilonewton. So we have our first force. We now have, we now know that CY, and it's actually the direction is correct, is one kilonewton and one kilonewton. So we're seeing in this example that sometimes it does not actually behoove us to go and do the, the global free by diagram first. In this case, I didn't see much to gain from doing that. So I just thought, and I, and I saw that something real, immediately popped out at me, which is that we had this member here that would have only three unknowns and that'd be relatively easy to solve. Okay, the next, I am going to do a summation of forces in the, uh, again, on just on member BC, I'm going to do a summation of forces. Oh, let's see, I already have CY, so I think I'll just do a summation of forces in the, in the Y direction. So I'm going to have negative FAB, negative FAB, uh, let's get that right, negative FAB, the mouse just really want the pen just really wants to do that lately. Having some issues with that. Cannot write the letter B today. Okay. Negative F A B. No, that doesn't look right. B. Come on, you. F A B. Finally, negative FAB uh, times the cosine of 45 degrees and then uh, plus CY, which is uh, one kilonewton, uh, plus one kilonewton, but then minus the two kilonewtons. And this equals zero. And so then uh, I'll have negative FAB times cosine 45 degrees. Uh, that's negative one, but then that becomes here that's negative one becomes positive one kilonewton over here. So FAB is equal to negative one over the cosine of 45 degrees. Um, so that would be the inverse of root two over two, or just, uh, let's see, well, normally that, that would just be the square root of two. Uh, square root of two. So yeah, the, um, root two over two. And then power, and yep, just square root of two. Uh, kilonewtons. So I guess we can just go ahead and do this in exact form because it's looking like it's going to turn out relatively exact. So FAB, the force carried in that is going to be uh, two kilo, root two kilonewtons, and that's actually going to be, as we've drawn this, this is going to be in tension on member FAB, but we don't necessarily need to worry about that right now. And then, uh, so we have that, so we now have uh, this one, which is root two, and this one, which is root two. And that's the same one here, uh, root two and root two. Okay, so we got that. What's next? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a, uh, I think still on BC, a summation of forces in the x direction. 
summation of forces on the x-direction, and I will have negative FAB uh, times the cosine of 45 degrees. Actually, that should have said sine of 45 degrees, but of course in this case it won't make any difference. Uh, cosine of 45 degrees, and then uh, plus CX is equal to zero. Plus CX is equal to zero, and CX then is going to be equal to uh, CX is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that will be uh, FAB times the cosine of 45 degrees, or root 2 times the cosine of 45 degrees. Root 2 times the cosine of 45 degrees, uh, times the cosine of 45, and I get, of course, exactly 1 kilonewton. So exactly 1 kilonewton. So actually, these are turning out to be a rather boring problem, but I guess that's what happens when you set all dimensions to one meter, and then you just go and uh, put things at 45 degrees. Oh well, that's okay. So lots of repetitive answers here, but that's okay. Hopefully. One kilonewton, and CX is one kilonewton. Now, uh, I think, how might I do this? Um, I might look at joint uh, A here. Just knock that one out joint A here. I'm going to draw a little free body diagram just kind of indicating how this work would work. Uh, joint A, if I were to consider this. Joint A, I'll just draw it as a circle actually. It has that root 2 kilonewton uh, force at an angle of 45 degrees. And it's going to be moving away from the joint because tension root 2 kilonewton, and again at 45 degrees, the same 45 degrees, and I would have AX and AY. However, I can just go ahead and draw these as the other direction now, because I know they have to be the opposite direction just looking at it. AX, I'm going to kind of violate one of my own cardinal rules here and reverse it on drawing. AY, and a simple summation of forces in each direction indicates that if you think about this, look, summation of forces in the x direction is going to be uh, negative ax uh, plus root 2, and it's literally the same um, uh, root 2 times the cosine of 45 times the cosine of 45 equals 0, and so ax is just uh, root 2 times the cosine of 45, and I get the same exact um, that is equal to 1 kilonewton, and by the same math I could see that AY is also equal to 1 kilonewton. AX is equal to 1 kilonewton, and AY is equal to 1 kilonewton. So a little bit boring, but not too unpredictable. So finally, I think I'm going to redraw this one on the other page, and then solve on the next slide, and solve for uh, DX, DY, and MD. So uh, all that's left is those three uh, moment forces, or uh, three forces at the, or the three reactions at the fixed support there. So I'm going to have, uh, let's see, and there were no negatives on here, so uh, CX is to the right, and C, uh, at least, well, um, oh, I made a little bit of error when I drew this. Hopefully you noticed that before, uh, before I did. CY is downward. That makes sense, actually. If this one is upward, this one should be downward. I'm putting these videos together a little too late at night, I suppose. Um, it's getting a little too late in the evening. So, um, anyway, so CX is going to be to the left and CY is downward. Each one equal, each one equal to one kilonewton. So we have uh, one kilonewton here, and then one kilonewton here. And then I'm going to have a dx, a dy, and then some sort of ma, or md. And uh, then we'll have our height, which was just one meter. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, say for member CD, this was joint C, and this was joint D. Uh, for CD here, our final equilibrium equations. A simple summation of forces in the y direction will lead us to uh, very easily that dy is equal to zero, or not dy is equal to zero, dy is equal to one kilonewton, uh, one kilonewton upward, one kilonewton 
upward, and then a simple summation of forces in the horizontal direction will lead us directly to that dx is equal to one kilonewton as well, but this time to the right. One kilonewton to the right. And then finally, if I do a summation of moments about joint D, I will get the following. I'll have MD, and the only one of these forces that doesn't have a line of action passing through point D is the CX here. Uh, MD uh, plus uh, one kilonewton, it's a positive moment, one kilonewton times a moment arm length of one meter. So that's uh, equals zero. So MD is actually negative, opposite the direction that we assumed. MD is equal to one kilo, negative one kilonewton meter, or a uh, clockwise moment. And that would be our final um, unknown force. So again, just working through all the basic equations of equilibrium, we have now solved for all of the member forces, all of the uh, joint forces, all the member end forces, all of the reactions on this particular uh, frame. And so we can see that uh, we also see uh, we've also seen how we can apply uh, the truss member condition when we are dealing with a simple frame like this. All right, so I think I might work through one more example, and we're going to call that example three. Now, for example three, I want to work through a basic set of frameworks, or a basic framework, a basic set of members. And I'm going to make this a little bit interesting by making this a couple, or applying a large couple as the primary load. So I'll mix it up a bit. And I am going to give this, I think, uh, fixed joints. Uh, so we'll have this, and then this here. This here, and then this here. So just a beam and two columns, relatively simple. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to then go ahead and support this with a pin and a roller support here and here. Now I'm going to go ahead and give this some dimensions. Oh, let's say from here to here is, hmm, let's give this thing a height of, hmm, I don't know, maybe 12 feet and maybe a width of 15 feet. Actually, let me give that an even number. Let's maybe, maybe make that 16 feet. And then right at the center, actually, maybe I'll do uh, eight feet and eight feet here. And that will describe the location of the couple right up here. And this is then, let's put a couple of, hmm, maybe a big couple of like uh, 500 uh, kip feet or something like that, big old couple. 500 kip feet. So 500 kip feet. And so all this is given, and fixed supports, pins, etc. Now, this will be statically determined. If we work through this, we'll have two, three, uh, well, let me count along, uh, two, five, eight, and nine unknown forces. And so we have, since we have uh, three equations of equilibrium on each, uh, on the beam and the two columns, or on each member, uh, I will then have, uh, this will be statically determinate. So we have this, and uh, this is given. And I wish to find, uh, find, uh, let's say the uh, member end forces, all member end forces. And I, you know what, I could probably just say all member end forces, and that would include any internal forces and uh, external reactions. Okay, so. Uh, solution. For this particular one, it is going to be beneficial to start by finding a, uh, applying a global free body diagram first. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw this as line elements. So I'm going to have my 500 kip foot moment right at the center here. Then uh, let me go ahead and give joint names, and they're not going to be very inspired joint names, but they are joint names nonetheless. You'll never guess what I'm going to do. A, B, uh, never would have guessed this. A, B, C, and D. 
Then, uh, let's say I I'm going to have reactions AX, and then AY, and then I'll have DY here. Now, let's see here. So, um, again, this is the global free body diagram, and then for on the global, I'm going to apply equations of equilibrium. So first, I'll do a balance of moments about joint A, and, uh, well, actually, you know what? Sum of forces in the x-direction. Let's just say if you do that, I hope by now it's fairly obvious if I do sum of forces in the x-direction, ax will be equal to zero. There is no, the couple is not a, the couple represents a pure rotation as we saw when you discuss couples, and so it will not produce any uh, net translational uh, force, so ax is equal to zero. Now, um, I could do, a, I might be tempted to do a summation of forces in the y direction, include that both ay and dy is equal to zero, but I don't want to do that just yet, as you'll see. Uh, let's do a summation of moments about joint A. And the reason for that is that, or what, the reason for that is that both the AX and the AY will not, AY will not generate a moment there, but DY will. So AY, or sorry, DY, times a moment arm length here, and it's going to be positive because uh, counterclockwise rotation about joint A, uh, DY times a moment arm length of, let's see, that's going to be 16 feet. And then uh, plus the 500 kip feet. Uh, the 500 kip feet is equal to zero, which means dy is equal to negative 500 uh, kip feet divided by uh, 16 feet, which will come to, let's see, let's go ahead and divide that out. Divide by 16, and I get negative 31.25 kips. Then, if I do a summation of forces in the uh, y direction on this, I can clearly see that ay will be equal, because if this is downward 31.25 kips, I can clearly see that ay will be equal to positive 31.25 kips, or 31.25 kips upward. And that will be my analysis for the global. So uh, now I'm going to go ahead and draw out a uh, exploded view or a, uh, a series of individual or local free body diagrams. And I'm going to go ahead and list all of, I'm going to change the directions on dy and such. So let's go ahead and get that. So I have this, and I'm going to give plenty of space between these so I can draw all those lovely forces that are going to be there. And then something like this, kind of looking like Stonehenge or something here. And then I'll show the forces on this. So I'm going to have, uh, let's see, dy will be downward of 31.25 kips. Uh, 31.25 kips. Then I'll have an upward force on joint A of also 31.25 kips. And that is, that's it as far as that goes. Then I will have a bx to the right here, although again, I'm just guessing whether it's to the right or to the left, and then a bx here, then a um, to the left if this was uh, to the right, then a by that I'm just going to go ahead and say is to is upward. Again, completely arbitrary. Uh, if I can quit from my pen, making my pen jump. By, and then an mb. And then equal and opposite, I'll have a downward uh, by, a downward by, and then a uh, mb here. Uh, uh, this would be a clockwise mb, a clockwise mb. Uh, then uh, some sort of clockwise mb. Then uh, here, let's say oh, I, I can't forget my 500 kip foot applied couple because that's going to be important for this uh, member. 500 kip foot. Then, uh, let's just say uh, if maybe if this by is downward, then this one should be upward. So I'll have a cy, then maybe a cx, and then maybe a, oh, I don't know, maybe a mc like this. I don't like how that's turning out. Let me erase some of this. So they're not totally on top of each other. Cy like this, and an, an mc here. 
And if that one is counterclockwise, then this one is clockwise. And then a downward CY here. And then a CX to the left here. Again, equal and opposite, equal and opposite, equal and opposite. Okay, so let's see here. I think I'm just going to work through this uh, from one end to the other. I'm going to start with this member, then I'm going to look at this member, then I'll look at this member. Although, actually, no, I, I think I'll start here, then I'll go here, and then I'll come back and check on that one. Because, actually, you know what? I'm not even going to need to use this one, I think. Um, because that one, so, that one has a lot more comple uh, complexity to it. So, you know what? I think I'm just going to uh, look at just this member and just this member, and that should give me everything I need. So, I'm going to look at member uh, AB here. Let's consider member AB. And I have joints A and B. And I think I'm going to do a summation of moments about, uh, well, first I'll do a summation of forces in the x direction. And that leads us to clearly that BX is equal to zero. BX is clearly equal to zero. Then I'm going to do a summation of moments. Let's do a summation, actually, of forces in the y direction. That tells us, oh, actually, if I have BY. Uh, plus 31.25 equals zero, then by is equal to negative 31.25 kips. So we actually assumed the wrong direction uh, for by. It's actually going to be pointing downward on uh, column AB and upward on column uh, on beam uh, BC. Then I can do a summation of moments. In, uh, let's do a summation of moments about, well, it wouldn't really matter whether we did A or B, but let's just say on B. Well, this is interesting because BX is zero and then neither of the vertical forces will generate any moment about B because their line of action passes through there. So I just have MB and that's it. BY or MB is just equal to zero. So that's equal to zero there. That's equal to zero. That's equal to zero. And MB is equal to zero. And this one is equal to negative 31 and negative 31.25. Just left that out, of course. And then um, let's look at member BC. So I'm applying equations of equilibrium on, uh, this time, member, uh, not BC, sorry, CD, on member CD or column CD if you prefer. So I'm going to do, uh, first of all, the same kind of thing. Actually, these are going to be very similar. Summation of forces in the x direction. Well, that will clearly show that CX is equal to zero. There is no uh, horizontal force there. If I do a summation of moments about joint C or about joint D, I can see that the only moment there is going to be MC. And that's just going to equal zero. So MC is equal to zero. So that's zero and that's zero. And then um, finally, I can just do a summation of uh, forces in the y direction. And uh, that will be negative CY uh, minus the 31.25 kips. And then I can get that CY, um, this of course equals zero because it's a statics class. And so CY is equal to negative 31.25 kips. Now, that does not mean that it is uh, downward. Again, in this context, a negative force, and I'm glad we arrived at this answer at the end of this lecture here, the uh, negative does not equal mean, does not mean that the force is downward. Negative in this context means that we simply assumed the wrong direction. So we know that CY is vertical on, the, on uh, CY is vertical here and downward here, is, oh, sorry, is upward on the column and downward on the beam. So. If I were to then actually redraw the correct free body diagram for this uh, column, or sorry, for this beam, uh, the beam uh, C, uh, BC here, what would I have? Well, there would be no moments applied to the ends of it, even though it is capable of holding moments. The only thing I would have is my 500 kip foot applied moment. And then the forces would be in the opposite direction we initially assumed. So I would have a, and actually for consistency, maybe I can write that on the big, big diagram as well, the negative 31 and the negative 31. And then if I were just to show it here in their actual true orientations, uh, C, uh, BY would actually be going upward. Uh, and again, this is on uh, beam BC. So that would be 31.25 kips. And then on this side, we would have downward 31.25 kips. And what's happening here, if you're, if it's not clicking yet, is that this is basically a couple. I have a couple separated by a distance, 
uh, two forces separated by, dis uh, by distance, and that will create a couple. And if you multiply 31.25 by 16, it is no coincidence that you get a magnitude, uh, a couple of a magnitude of 500. So basically, we have an applied couple that wants to cause this thing to, to cause the beam to rotate counterclockwise, and the uh, the joint forces, the forces in joint B and joint C, those forces are going to create an equal and opposite couple that will then rotate it back or cause it to rotate back or have a clockwise rotational tendency, which will then cancel that out. All right, I think this will do it for a brief introduction to uh, applying statics to solve for forces in frames and simple machines. Uh, please be on the lookout for lecture 12. We'll start looking at uh, we'll start looking at internal forces in members. All right, that'll do it for now. Thank you all for watching. Please let me know if you have any questions. If not, I'll see you all again uh, shortly for lecture 12. I hope you found this a little bit enjoyable. I hope you found this uh, illuminating to some degree, etc., etc. But regardless, I'll see you soon in lecture 12. And as always, thank you.